You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out. Basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Remember, options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. Mark Longo, Dan Passarelli, and John Critchley. All right, everybody, that thumping tune means it's time once again for Options Bootcamp, the program here on the old Options Insider Radio Network, where we break down the seemingly complex world of options and options trading and tell you, the busy retail stock trader, maybe you're dipping your toes into options for the first time, tell you how you can use these things called options in your own portfolios. My name is Mark Longo from the Options Insider Radio Network, as well as, of course, from theoptionsinsider.com. If you want one place to find all of the great episodes of Options Bootcamp, as well as pretty much everything else we do, the other dozen programs on this network, then theoptionsinsider.com is pretty much the best place to start. It's all there, all of our content from the world of options, as well as, of course, top left corner of the homepage. Click on the Insider Radio Network tab, and you have all 13 of our programs available for you there in living color to download or stream at your convenience course it's also available via all the major platforms itunes TuneIn, stitcher etc and if that's not enough for you it's even available in the app stores on those platforms via our options insider radio network mobile app which allows you again to download and stream so maybe you get on a plane you want to queue up some options learning for your flight well we can let you do just that so no shortage of ways for you guys to download and listen to our stuff and while you're listening may you have a question may you have a comment let us know We love to hear from you guys, the listeners. You're the reasons we do this program at the end of the day. And I am joined, as always, by the dark side to my light side, my options education nemesis, none other than Mr. Black Hat himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli of Market Taker Mentoring fame, as well as a few books here or there. Mr. Passarelli, welcome back to the Options Bootcamp program, sir. It has been too long. Yeah, it's been way too long. Uh, Ready to uh, to do some boot camp, and today though we've got a very special guest here, don't we? Today, Mark, we do indeed have a very special guest. And if it wasn't confusing enough having one Dan on the program, I decided to add a second. So we are joined by Mr. Dan Cook, of the major domo of all things biz dev and outreach over there at Nadex. Dan, welcome to the Options Boot Camp program. Dan and Mark, it is uh, great to be here, especially with uh, with two such esteemed industry professionals as yourselves. So for clarification for you as well as for our listeners, I'll refer to you as Dan C. And Mr. P is just maybe Mr. P or a few other names I like to call him throughout the program. He'll know when I'm referring to him. (laughs) But Dan, you've been on other programs on the network, some very recently, but this is your first appearance on the old Options Boot Camp program. This goes out to a little bit different audience out there and more of the people looking for the, uh, the basic options education. So why don't you go ahead and give those listeners a bit of an overview of your background in the space as well as what it is you guys actually do over there at NADA. Absolutely. I've been around for uh, um, a, a few years now, uh, I think about 15 to 17, uh, right in that range. And, you know, my background is uh, is, is in trading. Um, got killed in equities initially, um, you know, in the late 90s, was buying everything I could, thinking it was easy until about 2000. Learned a lesson and then decided I need to learn how to trade a little bit. So moved from futures into Forex. And really, this was a, a lead in and a great um, base uh, for my experience here at Nadex, because one of the things I saw, particularly in the leveraged markets, where people were trying to trade futures, uh, particularly in Forex, where you were looking at 100 to 1, 200 to 1, 400 to 1 leverage, people just getting crushed, uh, really eaten alive by the market, losing a lot more than they ever expected, and even more than they put into their account. 
with Nadex, and uh, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I, before I was even with the exchange, which now I'm biased because I'm with the exchange, but even before that, when I was working with traders, seeing how it impacted their, their life cycle and, and their trading ability, it, it just really made me very impressed. And where it's really different is, you know, if somebody wants to get exposure to the futures market or currencies market, they, could, they can go, you know, trade the big oil contracts at, you know, $1,000 a point risk and put up $6,000 in margin, but that's just too expensive for a lot of people, way too much capital and too much risk. What Nadex created was really a place where the individual trader could come in, become a direct member of the exchange, trade those markets based on commodities such as crude and gold or stock index futures like the E-mini S&P, the NASDAQ, or currencies, but do it in a smaller contract size, much less capital requirement. Additionally, all contracts are limited risk. And what that means is you can never lose more than you put up for a trade which was extremely important, uh, you know, having one that had to make uh, probably several hundred, if not thousand margin calls uh, over the uh, course of my, uh, my career. And then that's really what we've got going on here. And, you know, it's, it's really great to finally see it blossom and really get some traction. Well, Mr. Dan C., since you're on the program, we thought what better time than to do a deep dive into all things binary. So without further ado, we're going to keep on rolling into our basic training segment. All right, Boot, it's time to get live. What you're going to do is learn. You're going to learn how options work. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. You're going to learn options trading inside and out, basic to complex. There will be no failures. Do you hear me? Yes, sir. Call in. Print bear to learn. Yes, sir. I don't know about you, Mr. Dan P., but that, that intro always puts me in a festive, kind of like July 4th mood. I want to set off some fireworks after whenever I hear that. But of course, it also means that it's time for some options learning, some options education, a.k.a. some options 101. And as you mentioned there at the top of the show, uh, this segment's really going to be devoted to a deep dive into all things binary. You guys may have encountered these in various flavors and various capacities, maybe see an ad for them or somewhere else floating around sometimes the darker reaches of the Internet and said to yourself, hmm. Just what the heck are these binary options things? So that's what the question we're going to answer today. Dan, Dan Cook, <laughs> I'll just go with too many Dans on the program today. Dan Cook, you just kind of did kind of a, a basic overview uh, of the binary option. We'll kind of dive a little bit deeper in from there. But like you alluded there at the top of the show, uh, it really the binary, it's called that for a reason because it is very much a binary type product. It is a yes or no type product. And that's kind of what really, I think, appeals uh, to a lot of people at the end of the day, uh, you know, strip away all the other things. It's a very simple concept. Will X event happen by Y time frame? If you think it will, yes, then your contract is, is you're going to go for a yes. If not for a no, that's essentially what binaries are. But of course, there's a little bit more than just yes or no. You're not, you're not buying a contract that says yes or no, Dan. You're buying uh, something else that actually has a number attached to it. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and, and break down kind of how these things actually work from a pricing perspective. Someone goes over to nadex.com for the first time, they see a, a binary option listed there, and it's got a number next to it, let's say, a, let's say a 60. You know, what does that actually mean from a binary option perspective? A a absolutely. And one thing you mentioned was a, a deep dive into binary options. One of the great things is you can get very deep into them, uh, but one of their benefits is that they're really very simple to understand. Uh, if, if you see an option priced near 60, it's basically the probability or what the market's view of the probability is of that event happening. Say um, crude oil greater than 55 tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. If it's priced around 60, the market's basically saying there's a 60% chance that that will actually happen. Binaries are priced zero to 100. Every contract is worth $100, um, $1 per tick. And so it's very easy. All you do is take basically the price. I usually take the midpoint between the bid offer. So if I've got a, let's say a 56, 60, mid price is 58. Market's saying there's a 58% chance of that happening. And that's really as complicated as the price gets. It's, you have a strike price, so something like oil greater than 55. If oil is over 55 at that time, it should be priced over 50 because it's more than a 50-50 proposition that that would happen. If it's priced below 50, 
the underlying market, so the crude oil, is underneath that strike price. And that's really how the pricing works. It's just thought of as a probability, which a uh, quick point on that, um, because one, I know a lot of the people here um, you know, are very familiar with traditional options. One of the most difficult things for somebody, and I know it was for me as well, a lot of people I've worked with, is to actually overcomplicate the pricing to try to add too much into it. But it's really a great way to use with traditional options as well as for somebody who's just getting involved in options and wants to take that first step and start to learn how price and and time and, and, and volatility impact the market. Yeah, you know, Dan, um, my first exposure to binary options, I, I had that experience. I was teaching options for the uh, for the CBOE and and actually encountered somebody who said, hey, you know, we want, uh, you know, we want to talk to you about binary options, you know, kind of give us your thoughts. And, you know, if you were going to teach these to somebody, what would you how would you teach them? And I said, okay, well, here, let me look at it. I was supposed to meet them like a day or two later. And I sat down, I was putting together PowerPoints and I was like, well, wait a minute, let's see here. The, you know, volatility and Greeks and all this stuff. And I'm, you know, trying to like really figure it out. And then after like probably a couple hours of making them really, really complicated, I realized, oh no, it's just like this. Either you make this or you make that, or, you know, either you make this or you lose that. That's it. Simple. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, your your experience is not alone. I, you know, I was actually the same one when SIBO launched uh, their binary options back in 2007, and uh, I, I really wanted to make it more complicated than it was. I wanted to add everything in, and it, it even surprises me. Uh, it, industry professionals. I've been uh, a, a, a colleague here who works in my in my same building. He's been a futures trader for about 15 years, 20 years maybe. Uh, he called me up to his office. And he said, "Just sit down with me for an hour and explain how this pricing works." And when we just really looked at it and 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 just took it for what it was, it took about five minutes for him to really understand it. But yeah, it's it's typically one of the biggest issues is just overcomplicating it. And this is one of the nice things I like about them as well is, you know, we talk about implied things in traditional options pricing, implied volatility, what sort of probability, you know, this this type of price means. But if you say to say someone out there that this option, a regular standard equity option is trading for 60 cents, that doesn't intuit a lot to you. You can't look at that and say, oh, that's an easy 60 percent probability of this option expiring in the money. It doesn't work that way. Binaries do work that way. And that's kind of what makes them, I think, so uh, so straightforward to a lot of people. Here's the event, like you mentioned, gold closing above X price uh, by this this date. Uh, do you think it's going to happen? Yes or no? I think it's got about a 30 percent probability where there it goes trading at 30 cents. So that's that's kind of it's so straightforward and easy to intuit. I think for a lot of people who who get hung up uh, on the mechanisms of options, pricing standard listed equity options, I think that relatively straightforward nature of, of binaries, I think will be will be appealing to them. And just just to clarify really quickly, so you know, op- regular equity options have a multiplier and all that stuff, but binaries are pretty straightforward. So they're just quoted in ticks. So why don't you break down the ticks for us really quick? A- absolutely. So every contract is zero to a hundred. Um, each point or one, two, three, four is worth one dollar, and they tick in quarters. So if I've got a binary trading at seven point seven five. If I buy that binary at 7.75, I put up $7.75, basically because the worst case scenario if I'm a buyer is it goes to zero. It expires worthless. And in that case, that's the most I can lose, and that's also my collateral that I put up. And as you mentioned, there is no multiplier. I often say, okay, well, we've got this at, at 30, and right away options traders want to take that 30 and multiply it by 100. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of just like, it's almost like a reflex. Yeah, exactly. So that's not $3,000. If you buy one contract at 30, that's $30 um, to place that trade. And, and it's really that simple. That's pretty refreshing. I like that because, you know, you get into <laughs> we talk about a lot of different products here and you're right. The standard multiplier is 100. You get into the commodity options. It gets all sorts of haywire and the the margins and, and the multipliers get enormous and it gets very confusing. So the fact that it's 30 and it's really just 30 bucks. Uh, and that's also a 30% probability of that contract expiring in the money or doing what you want. Uh, I think that's a pretty palatable thing to a lot of people. It it really is. And I think one of the things also I want to point out, because a lot of times these are called all or nothing. And as we've talked about, at expiration, for the buyer, it's either going to be worth 100 or zero. Um, if it's worth zero for the buyer, the seller, it's it's worth 100. So it's always a $100 contract at expiration. I think one of the more interesting things and, and one of the things I've been reaching out on the education front, because for a while, uh, back in 2012, 2013, probably I would take a stab and say 95% of our contracts 
went to expiration. And I don't think that's always the best way to use a binary. There's nothing necessarily wrong with it. But for example, if, if I buy a binary at $10, the mark, market's basically telling me really there's a legitimately less than 10% chance of that happening when I consider the bid offer spread. So if it's trading at 610, I buy it at 10, there's probably an 8% chance of that happening. But I wouldn't be looking for that binary to go to 100. So if I'm trading in front of like uh, an FOMC announcement or something like that, I might just be looking for the market to move in my favor and that binary to shift in value. If the market goes up, my binary might trade at 30 why not take some profit there? And that's really one of the big missed points about binary because they're just considered all or nothing. People look at them sometimes like a coin flip, but they're very tradable instruments. And it's really important to understand, you know, I can take, if I trade 10 contracts, I can take half my position off at 30 and I've got a pretty solid trade at that point. And so it's, you know, it's one of those good things with binaries as well. You can trade in, trade out. So if I buy it at 50 and it drops back to 30, well, you know, maybe I want to cut my losses there. So you don't have to wait till zero or a hundred or expiration. That's true. The name is a bit of a misnomer in that sense because it does imply you're at all or nothing. The contract's worth zero or 100, essentially, at expiration. 100 being, of course, you went in the money. You, you, the event you predicted happened. Uh, but you're right. There is that whole trading range in there, and I think most people listening would gladly take a 2x or 3x profit and and get out, hit the exits. So you're right. They're, they're, they don't really have that perception to a lot of people, but you're, there is that kind of trading range, that fluidity in there that I think a lot of people uh, would be interested in. You know, and you, you touched on expiration. Let's just get into that a little bit, too, because these are a, a little bit different beast from uh, your traditional listed equity and index options, which mostly are longer term. They're monthly, they're quarterly, they get out into the years. L recently, we've seen uh, an explosion of interest in shorter duration, but even then, in most standard exchanges and listed contracts, you're going to see the quote-unquote short duration is a week or two weeks. So uh, a little bit different ball game when you're talking binaries what's your typical expiration cycle and length and and how 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 long are these things actually traded how far out can you go with the binary over there at nadex uh the the longest really and i've run i've run different models on them we, right now the longest we offer is a week and one of the reasons for that binaries by their very nature are short term if you think about it from a, pr a probability perspective and i'll use an extreme example let's say we tried to take a binary out for a year and uh, you know, so I have my list of strike prices. If, if and let's say it's on the E Mini S and P, I, I might have to have strike strike widths a hundred a hundred points apart or fifty points apart to take it out over a year, just to to try to cover that range. Now let's say uh, you know it's the start of the year and uh, the E Mini S and P has has a big move. Let's say it's thirty points. Well, that thirty points in the scope of a year is really nothing because it's about the probability of the range of the year, and so it's such a minuscule part it wouldn't even shift the pricing. Uh, typically, when I've, I've done the pricing models, they really don't get interesting until about two weeks out, um, where you can have reasonable strike widths to cover the range of the market, and where a move on a daily basis can actually have a large impact. Now, these trade as short as five minutes in the currencies, which, you know, for me, that's a little too quick. I think uh, uh, some people really love them. The people that are in there scalping the market really love them because you'll see them move from 20 to 50 to 70 in 20 seconds. Uh, a little fast for me, but I think one of the big benefits that I've seen from them is, you know, if, if you take a look at a demo account, and when we just had daily binaries, somebody could basically, if they're trading one market, have one opportunity a day to kind of watch how a binary functions. And I don't know how many people want to sit there for 10 or 12 hours and just watch one contract and see how it, how it functions, particularly if not much is going on. But with the five minutes, you can actually learn everything you need to know about binaries uh, in a very short period of time, how they're impacted by time, how uh, basically the movement, um, what, what we've coined exponential delta, or ex it's really an exploding gamma play, um, where they act a lot different than traditional options. And so by having that compressed time frame, it, it really helps that learning curve go very fast. Again, probably too quick for me. I would, I would probably be more uh, on the intraday side for the two hours or daily contracts. Yeah, five minutes is a little bit of, of a short window for me as well. By the time you get down to the computer, set it up and everything, your, your, your contract's done. <laughs> so uh, you know, I need at least 10 minutes. A a absolutely. You know, one, one of the reasons uh, we see a lot of traction in our two hour. And one of the things, you know, this week we've got uh, earnings announcements, uh, you know, in, in, in particularly Apple, which has a, an opportunity to really move the NASDAQ. And we're seeing people set those up now for that because they're playing it double-sided. And that's really one of the great use cases is they don't have to buy a lot of time premium as they might in a traditional option. Uh, the FOMC announcement tomorrow, if they want exposure around that, 
they can get exposure for the 20 minutes following the announcement or for two hours following the announcement. And that's really one of the big things is particularly around those types of events. Yeah, I'd imagine, particularly on expiration, this has got to be, these, all these contracts have to be pretty interesting because they're, they're vacillating from zero to 100 or very close to it at a very, <laughs> very rapid rate. So I'd imagine if you want a little bit of action, uh, th- that time frame, I think, would be kind of interesting. And you mentioned the Delta and, indeed, the Gamma. Uh, so I'd be remiss if I didn't, indeed, give Mr. P an opportunity to weigh in on that. I'm not sure if you know this, Mr. Cook, but he did, indeed, write the books, the book, I should say, multiple books, but one on the options Greek. So, Dan, you kind of touched on how simple these products are, but there are some Greeks equivalents going on there. Of course, the rapidly exploding Delta, which implies a lot of gamma going on there. So so what's your quick take on, on the Greeks perspective here with these binaries? Yeah, what's interesting about binaries and, you know, the elegant simplicity of them, if you will, is that the Greeks become kind of simpler too, I I, I think. You know, Dan mentioned the delta slash gamma sort of component to them. And that's because, you know, their their directional by nature in that they are either above where they need to be or below where they need to be, you know, above or below the strike rate. But with traditional options, the, the, the time premium component, which is also called the volatility component to option prices. That's where time decay comes from, and that's where implied volatility slash vega comes from, and you don't see that with binaries. And the the reason is because with traditional options, where that stems from is the fact that, well, if the option is a penny above the strike price, then it's worth, you know, X is worth a penny or something, if we're talking about a call. But if it's $10 above the strike price, then it's worth $10. So there's this inherent potential volatility aspect to them where if there's a big move, it's worth more. If there's a small move, it's worth less. And so that gives rise to to that time premium component where somebody says, well, you know, hey, I'd be willing to pay a little over and above, above and beyond parity because this could be worth a whole lot to me if there's a big move here. So because you don't have those with binaries, you don't have time premium, so you don't have time decay, so you don't have theta, and you don't have implied volatility, so you don't have vega, and you don't have all the questions that newbie traders have in terms of, well, what's implied volatility? How does that all work? And you know, what should this option be worth? And why is it worth more than parity? And why is it worth more than it was yesterday? And all that. So, you know, it's from a Greek standpoint. They're a lot simpler. You got delta and, you know, kind of like this gamma sort of scenario, but but there's no theta or vega to worry about. Sounds like there won't be a very fertile market then for your next book, which is binaries and the Greeks. Probably more of a novella in that sense. Yeah, yeah, it'll be it'll be a short one. Maybe a, maybe a white paper, <laughs> a one pager. <laughs> but you know that is kind of I guess to the simplicity of these, and for people who are you know off put. Even though Dan, you and I have done a done a, I think a laudable job of trying to break these complex instruments down over the years. Uh, people sometimes still come to these, and they're just they're just put off by the various arcane minutia and terminology and all the things uh, we talk about here on a regular basis. And so something like the binary. I think if that is indeed you, that describes you, you're kind of uh, overwhelmed by all that. I think binary may be a good good starting point. Now, let's talk about starting points other than Dan C, because we're talking about these, these products. You can do all these things with them. But what what can we actually trade with these things? I mean, what what you mentioned the currencies. That's obviously one. You touched on some indices. If I want to go over, let's say if I go over to Nadex right now, what can I actually trade with the binary? Well, uh, we offer a few different uh, asset classes. So, uh, stock index futures, so contracts based on the stock index futures, so things like the uh, E-mini, S&P, NASDAQ, Dow, Russell, as well as a few international indices, the FTSE, DAX, uh, the Nikkei, uh, and recently the China A50. Uh, and then the commodities, uh, a couple of the more popular are, of course, gold and oil, um, things that make headline quite a bit, but we also have silver and copper, uh, natty gas. I'm not even going to mention, uh, by virtue, I'm going to mention the ags. Just don't look at those. Uh, we need some, we need a new market maker in there. So if you're an ags trader, you might want to wait a little while as that market matures a little bit. But then also the currencies. And so really what we what we found, they're always going to be traded on, on 
on the most liquid underlying markets, the most popular underlying markets. So really, whatever you're looking for exposure to, it's there. Now, one question that comes up a lot is, uh, can I trade single stocks on these? And not through Nadex, as we're CFTC regulated rather than SEC. Although some very good news, the NYSE um, is launching their binary contract. Uh, here, I believe it's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, which will really, I'm guessing that week, be kind of a soft launch for them, which is probably a good thing. But they're going to be offering binary options on the top, my understanding is the top 75 sing, uh, traded single stocks as well as ETFs. And so that's, that's very exciting to see a, a name like the NYSE, who most people have heard of, uh, get involved in this market. Yeah, since you mentioned the regulatory aspect, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up. In, in any discussion of binaries, there's that cloud I mentioned earlier. I kind of jokingly referred to the dark side of the Internet, but we see this all the time here at the Options Insider. We're pitched almost daily uh, on some obscure, bizarre binary options exchange out of Croatia or South Africa or wherever else they are, certainly not in the U.S., uh, because there's too much regulation here for them, and they all pitch their products. So the truth is, li listeners, you can trade binaries just about anything you want out there. The reason I mentioned the products that Nadex has, and not just because Dan's here, he's the reason he's here, is because what he just mentioned. They are actually domiciled here in the U.S. They have, you know, there's an exchange entity. You can go see Dan. He, he's actually here in Chicago. He's not often he's not often Bosnia or Herzegovina or some other esoteric part of the globe where regulations a little bit thinner. They are a regulated entity. They are an actual exchange. You can should go become a member of the exchange. So uh, that's one of the problems that binaries have had for a long time is that they've kind of been been uh, promoted by, let's say, the less reputable aspect of the financial markets. And that's why I was so excited to see when Hedge Streak becoming Nadex and really starting to put a lot of a uh, lot of actual stamp of official regulatory approval on these products, because that's something these products have needed for a long time. And and that's why I feel comfortable now having a firm like Nadex on here versus, let's say, Joe's Binary Exchange out of Bosnia. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there is a, a bit of difference, and, and you nailed it, Mark, the regulation. I'm just going to put that out to listeners, I think, which you got pretty much just nailed. But, you know, if, if you're looking at trading binary options, uh, in 2013, the SEC and CFTC put out a joint fraud advisory. Recently, the SEC just put out their list of, of companies they consider fraudulent. No matter what you're going to trade, whether that be binary options or, you know, if you're looking to get into Forex or whatever, make sure uh, you're, you're, you're trading with a firm that's regulated here, you know, in the United States under firm regulation, uh, not just a stamp from some uh, whatever country, wherever in the world that has no regulation. It's, it's a very important aspect. And as Mark said, yeah, you know, when you said that the darker parts of the, uh, of the Internet, unfortunately, that's where a lot of these uh, – I'll just call them other firms rather than getting into too many expletives, uh, have really thrived. So just always make sure you're trading with somebody who's, who's regulated uh, here in the United States, uh, CFTC or SEC. Yeah, that's no slight to, of course, Joe's House of Binaries over there in Bosnia, but I don't think they meet the same regulatory standards as you guys over there at Nadex. So if you are one of those people out there, listeners, and you kind of seen binaries floating around out there and you're like, I've kind of been a little bit scared of that. Uh, if that's been the thing that puts you off, then I think uh, maybe the fact that Nadex is a heavily regulated entity, just like all the other exchanges you see out there, I think could help you sleep at night a little bit. All right, Dan, both Dan's. We've hit on some of the basics of binaries here in terms of, you know, the products they can trade, the ticks. Let, let's walk through an actual example of how you could actually use these things in the market. I pulled one of these listeners straight from actually I went over to the Nadex website. They have a bunch of great examples there. So if you want to follow along yourself, it's right there. Just look at the binary examples. They have to have it break, broken out very nicely in graphs of profit and loss. We're just going to run down a, a few examples. The first one I pulled, Dan, was uh, your essentially your NASDAQ contract, which I believe you refer to as your U.S. Tech 100. Uh, I like your, 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 your terminology there. And in this example, uh, you suggest that the NASDAQ, a.k.a. the U.S. Tech 100, is going to be above the level of 2,224 by 2 p.m. If you, if you agree with that, and in this example you do, uh, then you buy that contract, and you, you buy 20 of them. Uh, and uh, they're at the price in this example were offered at 44 bucks. And again, like we mentioned before, each of those contracts worth a buck a point. So you know right away when you shell out that money, you're shelling out 880 bucks. So you know right away uh, that if that goes to zero, that's the most you can lose. You're not going to go into debit or anything along those lines. On the same point, you know that contract can go all the way up to 100. So the most you can make on that bet 
is $1,120. So it's a very straightforward uh, type of transaction to get in. You know, we malign those a lot here on this program, the kind of the expiration graph way of instructing about options. But it is it is, it is is instructive when it comes to binaries. So that's kind of what you're getting a lot there is that kind of those kind of polar extremes. And so if you think in that way, when you're looking at regular options, I think binaries will make a lot of sense to you. So it's pretty obvious how this contract is going to play out. If at 2 p.m., if the contract is above 2224, then you're at 100. If it's below at, I should mention at or below. That's a ticking point for some people. They think if it's just at, if it pins on the strike, you're getting paid. Nope. It's at or below uh, 2224, then that contract is worth zero. Uh, so, uh, so if you're worried about pinning, <laughs> watch out for that one. Uh, and so then it breaks down pretty easy. If it's above, above that level, it's at a hundred. So you made $1,120. Uh, so you made a, a gross, or a gross profit of $56 a contract. It went from 44 to hundred. And if you lost it, you pretty much lost 44 bucks a contract. And of course, as we outlined in that example, there's going to be a lot of trading ranges in there. So you can get out at other prices. If the, if the contract is moving towards that price, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a lot of different areas uh, we can go into with that. But that's kind of your basic example. Uh, Dan, C, anything I really left out there or missed in that kind of uh, basic options or binary options use case? A, and then B, is that the typical starting use case for a lot of new binary traders that they come in and pretty much buy a, buy a binary call, essentially? Yeah, you know, that's that's uh, pretty much it. I think you, you really uh, nailed it. The one thing I will point out is, you know, say, for instance, we, we bought those contracts of $44. And... 20 minutes later, as has happened to me often when I uh, when I'm trading, the market just slams against me. If that that binary may trounce all the way down to zero, but you're not out of the trade. Um, so just because it hits zero or 100 or you go to no bid or no offer, you're not out of the trade. And so people that have traded other markets, say Forex or futures where they've traded the underlying, they, they're used to using stops. They get stopped out or slipped. Um, you can never get slipped on a binary option. So even if it does drop down, say you buy it at 10, if it goes to zero, it, it doesn't matter. You've already seen your your maximum loss of 10 but you're basically buying time to be right similar to buying you know a put or a call you're not out of it and uh, that's something for you know maybe non-options traders and more of the underlying market that you're, you're just never stopped out in these but no your example was uh, perfect and dead on mark well, I did pull it from a reputable source, so <laughs> if there was a problem, I'd have to blame you. That's something you did touch on, though. I don't think we hit on that at the top of the show. When we talk listed options, we're always talking calls and puts. A binary, a bit of a different beast. It's kind of sell or, or buy or sell. Uh, that's kind of the way you treat calls and puts. So people coming to you looking for, let's say, a binary put, they may be a little bit uh, confused. Yeah, you know, it, uh, r really, in, in a way, a binary, you could almost consider it a single-leg option spread. It really has a similar characteristics. Uh, you know, if, if you're selling, your worst case scenario is 100. So if you think the market's going to go down and maybe the market's trading, you sell it around 80, your worst case scenario is 100. Um, so you'd put up $20, the difference between 100 and 80. So 20 bucks per contract. That's the most you can lose. Doesn't matter if World War III breaks out, um, if you're trading oil and all of a sudden OPEC releases a trillion barrels, whatever the case may be, you can never go beyond the 0 or 100 level. So if you sell it at 80, you put up 20 bucks with the potential to make 80. And they're, they're just that simple. Yeah, that's interesting. By the way, spreads, glad you changed the name from bull spreads. That used to drive me crazy. I know we had a, a long back and forth, you and I, about that on one of our other programs, uh, the Futures Options Roundtable. Buying a bull spread, selling a bull, selling a bull spread is just so counterintuitive. So I'm glad <laughs> to see they are now just Nadex spreads. They are. And, and, you know, I did see a presentation actually yesterday that was uh, sent to me by someone internally who referred to them as as bull call spreads. It, it was just like, wait a minute, hold on. It was just flashbacks of, of all the confusion that that term called. Uh, so, or the, you know, that that term uh, because they they can for both binaries as well as our spread contracts, they can you can be either bullish or bearish. Basically, if you're bullish, you buy. If you think the market's going to go down, you sell. It's that simple. Yeah, so if you're coming in looking for, I'm bullish, I want to buy a call, I'm bearish, I want to buy a put, doesn't really work that way. You have to sell if, you're, if you have that, uh, that downside expectation. Now, other Dan, Dan P., uh, you know, Dan C. just hit on a kind of quick example with crude, but we got some other examples here uh, for spreads, because that's obviously once people start, start dipping their toes into the binary waters, they're going to want to start slinging some spreads. And that's where a lot of the action is over there, and particularly on the Nadex platform these days. So how would you like to walk our listeners through a, kind of a basic binary spread example? 
Yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do with with uh, binaries, and one of them uh, is is to put on a spread. So the spreads are going to work similarly, but maybe by a little bit differently than traditional option spreads. I mean, basically, you can set up a binary trade where you know if it's between point A and point B, basically, you have somewhat of a profit, but if it's beyond point B, then you have somewhat less of a profit. You know, you basically, you just take a, posi a long position at one strike and a short position at another strike. Um, now, another thing that I think is sometimes somewhat interesting is this idea of, of laddering out different strikes. Because, you know, the one big difference, well, the, the major big difference and the one that I touched on earlier between binaries and traditional options is that, well, if the binary is in the money, then it's in the money. That's it. You get paid out X. Whereas with the traditional option, well, how much is it in the money? Is it a little bit in the money? Then I get paid out a little bit. Is it a lot in the money? Then I get paid out a lot. So you can kind of replicate that somewhat using binaries where I can, I can get long at, at one strike and then I can get long at the next higher strike and then get long, you know, the, the next higher strike and so on and so on and so on. And so then you don't have sort of that perfect tick for tick, you know, straight line, you know, payout structure that you have with like a call, but you're able to replicate it somewhat. And, and you can actually sort of, sort of customize it to be exactly what you want. You know, you can, you can ladder it for three strikes or you can ladder it for five strikes or 10 strikes or, or you know, whatever. So you can really, you can really sort of control your risk in that regard to just the area that you want exposure. And I'm glad you brought that up because there are a lot of ancillary use cases for binaries. And I, I want to bring up a couple of those in a second, but you brought up an interesting point as well there, Dan. Now, other Dan, Dan C, uh, talking about, you know, the straight up binaries, you buy them, you sell them versus the spreads. Uh, what is what is the breakdown these days over there at Nadex? Are people coming in and pretty much slinging the individual binaries? Are they really diving into the spreads? What's 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 their primary use case, A, and B, what's, what's the hot product over there in Nadex land right now? Right now, um, and, and it has been actually uh, kind of historically, is that we're really known as a binary option exchange. Um, if, if you open an account and, and one of our customer service people calls you with a question, they're going to say they're calling from Nadex, the binary option exchange. I'm somewhat biased. Uh, I, I think, I think our, our spread contracts, which are more linear, more familiar you know, to people that have traded the underlying markets uh, straight from the get-go, I think they're a better contract, but they've always been around 10 to 15% of our overall volume. Now, one of the reasons for that is all of our advertising, all of our marketing, and all of our initial education was done towards binary options, and that's really how we're known. Uh, even so, what we see are the people trading the spreads, really, um, they, they, they just uh, love them. They're, they're much easier contract, particularly if you're trading, and, and a great use case is if you're trading the underlying markets. So if you're trading oil or you're trading uh, E-mini S&P, you can use those as a much more linear hedge than a binary option. And so we're, we're seeing that used quite often. We're still dominated by binary options. Of course, I think we list uh, probably 4,000 binary option contracts a day compared to about 50 or so spreads. So it is a bit skewed in, uh, in that range as well. But you know, both of them are great contracts and, and binaries have a great use case. Um, but I think spreads on the day to day, and again, I'm biased, even though we're known as binary options, and maybe I'll get a pink slip for saying this, I think the spreads are really the, the better of our two contracts. And is the hot is the hot uh, underlying right now? Is it is it the indices or is it crude? What, what's lighting up the tape over there at Nadex right now? Uh, you know, right now, particularly this week, um, which which would make sense. Uh, seeing a lot of we always see a lot of activity in the E Mini S and P five hundred. It's a uh, a great contract that that a lot of people know about and a lot of people have wanted to trade but just couldn't go in and and and, and trade those contracts. Uh, through a futures account for fear of just getting chewed up and spit out where they can get exposure. That's always a popular one. Uh, this week, actually, um, and, and today in particularly, and uh, for the weeklies on the NASDAQ, I'm guessing, you know, we've got some big earnings coming out, such as Apple. That's seen a lot of traction. FOMC tomorrow as well, we've seen a lot of people start to take uh, positions, not just in weekly, but we have 24-hour uh, uh, currency contracts. A lot of action in those uh, 
all the time, but particularly today or anytime there's a major news announcement, so a, an ECB decision. Uh, and you know, just as, a, as an example, without giving too much away here, by what I'm seeing as far as the activity in contracts like the Euro USD, it seems that people are under the assumption and again, I'm just taking a guess, but by, by looking at the positioning that the Fed will say something, not that they'll necessarily change rates, but they'll make some type of indication that would cause some strength to the, to the dollar. Uh, so, you know, we've, we just had uh, was it ECB last week come out and talk a little bit about um, – that uh, you know they they were, they were looking at potentially more quantitative easing. They didn't really give any numbers or anything. But uh, you know it looks like the positioning right now. People are expecting a strong dollar from from the Fed tomorrow. Yeah, you mentioned one interesting use case there, which is of course you know using these products around those types of events. You know, obviously you guys don't have a straight up Apple product, which is why the the Amex listing of binaries is so interesting. We'll get to that in a little bit because they can directly play the Apple then or presumably. Uh, but they can, of course, if you think Apple's going to move the index, then the NASDAQ will be the place you want to go. Or if you want to go more for uh, another one in the S&P, then, of course, S&P can go. And, of course, Apple moves everything. So you can go pretty much any index with Apple and you have a decent chance of it, uh, of it rocking and rolling. But that, that lays out some other interesting use cases that I've seen for binaries over the years. And I think one of my favorites, Dan, is something you and I have discussed in the past, and that is, you know, someone trading traditional equity options could be Apple options, S and P, whatever the case may be, and they have something on. Maybe they're they're short a lot of premium. Maybe they're short an at the money straddle, for example, or something like that. And they don't want to turn around. And we've seen this a lot. People are reluctant to spend money to protect themselves, to hedge themselves. They don't want to buy uh, commensurate contracts in the listed options market. But maybe in this scenario, they're only really concerned about a, a brief event. Could be maybe an earnings or could be some other a call, a conference call after the close, something like that, or maybe a crop report, whatever the case may be. Some brief event is really what they're worried about. They don't need a whole week's or a whole month's worth of premium just to hedge that one event. So in that case, coming in and hedging with the binaries, essentially a strangle in that sense, is kind of an interesting uh, use case. Uh, maybe I guess we'll start with you, Dan C., then we'll go to Dan P. Uh, is that a use case you're seeing a lot more of over there at Nadex? And is that one of your uh, one of your personal go-tos? <laughs> we uh, we we do see uh, quite a bit more of that. It, it's really been an education aspect, but. Really, one of those things on, on the on the short option strategies where we're seeing them used, and I want to point out because binaries can be difficult to use as a hedge because of the all or nothing uh, aspect of them. So where we're seeing them used is, uh, for instance, if if the market moves big in one direction or the other, say, and and the trader in, in their regular options uh, short position is going to take a lot of heat, what they're using the binaries for is putting them out on the wings for cheap insurance. Now, they're not waiting for them to get to zero or 100, but one of the you know, kind of pricing components of a binary option is if it's at the strike price and there's still some time remaining, it's got to trade somewhere around 50. So, for example, they might sell a binary at 95. So if the market makes a big drop down, and it might not even be that big a drop down, they can take heat. But what they're going to do is if the market gets to that strike or that level, um, where they say that's their maximum amount of heat, that's going to be their binary strike. And so they might put a limit order out to close that position out at 55 for a total of $40, uh, $40 per contract and then use a commensurate number of contracts to offset that much heat that the market may be giving them. And they'll do that on either side. So they put up 5 bucks to really buy a whole lot of protection. Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> to what... Dan was saying, and then re referencing a little bit earlier too, what Mark was saying about you know hedging traditional options and that sort of thing. You know, there's not sort of that that perfect hedge because of what we've been talking about, but there are more complex structured arbitrage opportunities, and uh, in those sort of situations, you know, when you're looking for specific market timing scenarios or you know small mispricings. Um, you know, it it can potentially uh, be a situation where professionals and maybe even clever non-professional traders can look for certain arbitrage opportunities. Yep. Have you ever counseled perhaps a, a mentee over there at Market Taker? Uh, perhaps they had something on. You said, hey, you know, uh, you know, maybe instead of hedging with this weekly, uh, you come in and pick up this binary instead. Or is that maybe a use case you'll consider down the road? Yeah. I mean, I've I've talked uh with students about binaries probably more often on you know just trading speculating as, as opposed to hedging but um yeah yep 
Another thing I want to touch on for an interesting use case for binaries, and this applies even if even if you don't trade them. You may listen to the show and say, the heck with all those Dans, I'm not trading this thing. <laughs> but you still may want to pay attention to them and surf on over indeed uh, to Nadex, if that is the case. Uh, because as you mentioned at the top of the show, because that price is is a pure probability at the end of the day, it, it does imply some interesting use cases as an indicator, as essentially a sentiment gauge. And Dan C., I know you're you're cooking up some interesting stuff, pun intended there as well, uh, in terms of using this as a, as a sentiment indicator. I know it's not ready yet, but give us a little bit of a hint of what people can come in and expect that they want to do use these as, as essentially just gauging the, the interest level of sentiment out there in the marketplace. Well, you know, they, they've often been uh, be called prediction markets because you're looking at a probability. This is what the market and the participants view the probability of that happening is. As such, um, one of the things I've been looking at now for, for several years uh, is what we call a volatility sentiment indi- indicator. Probably, uh, you know, if it's, I'd say it's almost less of a volatility than just a straight sentiment indicator. But one of the things with the binary is when we see a lot of people trading, say, selling very high, 75 or 80, and buying low, say, you know, 15, 20, 25, that typically means there's a bit more volatility. People are expecting a bigger move. Something's on the horizon. Now, this wasn't very interesting a few years ago when we had a few hundred people trading every day. It didn't, you know, you know, one person could basically, if they came in big, screw up the whole indicator. But now that we're seeing thousands and thousands and thousands trade these every day, uh, the gauges are really starting to to come along as a real-time, I guess it is volatility, real-time um, what the market is expecting, the volatility, rather than a 30 plus 30, it is what are we expecting today because of the short-term nature? That's both good and bad. Because of the short-term nature, you're not looking out what is it going to be for this week, but you're basically saying, okay, it's 8 o'clock in the morning. What am I looking? And uh, it's been very interesting. Like you said, we're not ready to release it yet, but it's something I'm looking forward to because I, I, you know, I'm going to have a few people vetting this out for me uh, to get their thoughts, but it has been pretty interesting, particularly what we saw in August. Uh, as as an indicator, uh, when we kind of August twenty fourth there, when things started going crazy, I think it'll be something that's very interesting, uh, particularly as we see even more participants come into the market. Yeah, I really like that use case because people at the end of the day they have a hard time sometimes wrapping their heads, like we said, around uh, what's going on with an option and what it implies for the marketplace. But the binary is pretty straight up. So if you want that inherent probability, what actual money? is predicting and again that's why the nice thing about these types of markets is that there's real money on the line it's not some analyst estimate or something else at the end of the day that really has no teeth to it this is what people are wagering actual money on so we know from every study that those are usually the most predictive markets at the end of the day Uh, so if you're interested in that that's probably reason alone to give these things a quick once over at the very least because we're talking about what's coming down the pike mr cook will bring this options, basic options training here, a segment to a close with some other things you guys may have on the horizon coming down the pike over there at Nadex. Maybe we'll kick off again really quick. You mentioned it's not your product, but I know you're pretty excited about it. What's coming out of the pike from from Amex Uh, listeners, you may be familiar long, long ago in the primordial ooze of this network. We did some uh, content, some shows with the Amex based on their original incarnation of binary options. Those were indeed binary options on the equity. So that's attractive if you like that. What we're talking about here, but you want to apply it maybe to an underlying you're more familiar with, like an Apple, uh, that is a use case you could use it for. And they, those initial products had some had some bumps in the road. They met a few roadblocks, and they kind of went away. But now it looks like Amex and, of course, Ice, their parent company, doubling down again on the old binary side of the space. And I think rather than viewing these as competitive, Dan, these are actually kind of, you think, you think additive to you guys because, A, it helps you you guys don't have to get into uh, the SEC game, which I know is a fun one, uh, but also it, it probably will bring more eyeballs to the binary space at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about it for, for several reasons. One, I, I work for an exchange that trades binary options. As such, I can't be biased to our contracts, which means I can't trade our contracts, even though I think they're fantastic contracts. I can trade the NYSE contracts because we don't list anything based on those. So I personally am looking forward to getting into this market. Uh, Apple earnings, uh, which is on deck tonight, is is a great use case for those. Very excited, though, because, you know, 2007, when I started looking into these, there was nothing out there. One of my main uh, to, to learn, there was no education at all. And now there's several books out there, websites dedicated to, to, uh, you know, to just learning about these. And I think really the timing will be right for them at this point. And, you know, forever we've been the lone voice in the wilderness sort of calling out saying trade binaries. 
And uh, having somebody like the NYSE come into this market really shows the legitimacy and, and really bodes well for the future growth. And I'm, I'm very excited. Yeah, I'll have to recycle some of those articles we wrote oh years ago, back in 2007, about uh, the old binaries and see how much of that still applies today. Interesting stuff. Well, that's it for our basic training segment here on the old options boot camp program listeners. But because so many of you guys like this program and, and write in, I'll make sure to give you guys a little bit of love on the old program as well. So without further ado, we're going to roll on into a real quick mail call segment. Mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. All right, everybody, welcome to the mail call. Like the man said, this is the portion of the show where you guys get to join us here on the old program. No shortage of ways for you guys to do just that. Hit us up on Twitter. We're just at options on Twitter. We're the options insider on Facebook, options insider on stock twits or find our website. You can reach us via the comment feedback form there or to shoot us an email questions at the options insider.com. No shortage of ways for you guys to make your voices heard. And, and Dan C, this one came in a while ago and I kind of, uh, it kind of got tabled, but then I thought we're talking binaries today. You're coming on the show. It might be a good time to, to bring this question uh, to the fore here. This one comes from, from uh, Jeb 16. He writes, Hey, I've seen a number of sports books online offering products that appear to be sports derivatives. Is it possible to trade actual products based on sports outcomes or other event type derivatives in a legal exchange traded form in the U.S.? Well, Dan, see this question has you written all over it. It might be worth mentioning, too. One of the reasons I thought about you for this one as well is kind of mentioning kind of the origins of Nadex coming out of that head street, which was indeed kind of uh, aiming to be this type of events type type uh, products. And then they have since evolved into what you list today. So a lot we can hit on here with this question. Absolutely. It's been, it's been quite a, uh, quite a, quite a journey. And uh, in the U S I'll just answer the, the question straight up in, on, in a legal exchange form in the U S uh, the answer is no. Now there are places overseas, but again, you're, you're taking a lot of risk. Anytime you're dealing with those, I would definitely make sure, you know, that, uh, check with their regulators, and it shouldn't be somebody out of Cyprus or some other place like that because the odds of getting your money back aren't good. But basically in the U.S., um, you won't see these on a legal exchange, uh, either from the SEC or CFTC. And the reason is all of the contracts we list um, have to meet several qualifications, uh, and, and one of those is a widespread economic impact. Now, some may argue that the Super Bowl has widespread economic impact, uh, but that's not really the case. So you can do contracts on things like uh, just a straight up non-farm payroll number, which we offer, uh, you know, just the number or things such as financial markets. Uh, but you can't see them on uh, the, you won't see them on a regulated uh, legal exchange in the U S someday, perhaps, but uh, not, not yet today. <laughs> if, if, if they change their tune uh, quite rapidly, uh, uh, you know, I, I, although these contracts, I mean, they, they are traded very heavily in the UK on sport. And uh, but just not on a legal U.S. exchange. Well, it seems like all the backlash against those those fantasy sites recently may indeed cause some of that legislation to change. So that might be kind of interesting. Uh, who knows? Maybe that'll pave the way for uh, the eventual Nadex uh, Broncos versus Niners contract, something crazy like that. <laughs> As a Bears fan, I'm putting the Bears greater than anybody at about a no <laughs> bid for offer. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be a poor market maker on that contract, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Let's see. We have time, I think, for uh, one more quick one. Uh, here's a good one for you, uh, Dan P. This one comes from Amelia. Amelia G. Thought that the lady's writing in. She writes, hey, do you notice anything different in the options trading in higher volume products versus lower volume products? So, Dan P., this is a good a uh, quick one. Why don't you run down some of the uh, the salient points? What you what you're going to see in a product that has a lot more liquidity to it, a lot more volume going through it versus one that's a little bit less liquid. Yeah, the biggest difference is there's more volume. <laughs> but um, bum, we need a rim shot on this show. <laughs> oh, oh, let me tell you. No, but uh, there there are some Im- important implications to that, or at least can be. One of the questions that I'm always asked to talk about by people is is liquidity. And people come up with all these things like, well, you know, somebody taught me that if I look at the volume and the open interest and I multiply it by pi and it's a full moon, then that means it's liquid. Well, you no, know, what it really means if it's liquid is are the bid ask spreads tight. You know, unless you're trading 500 contracts at a crack, that's really all you care about is bid ask spread. But, you know, if you are a somewhat larger trader, typically the the names that have more volume in them 
they tend to have tighter bid ask spreads. And why? Well, because there's more people trading them. You know, if um, if if the market is two bid at two fifty and there's nobody trading it, then it's it's going to stay two bid at two fifty. But if all of a sudden there's you know ten thousand people trading it, well, then somebody's going to be two forty nine off, and somebody else is going to be two hundred one bid, and you know it it just naturally makes the markets tighter. So it makes it easier to get in and out of the trade without um, paying up too much to the market. Arguably. I think because there probably ends up being more two-sided paper is what we uh, call it, which means that uh, the option trading probably doesn't influence the underlying stock price as much, although I guess one could probably argue the other side of that as well. Uh, but you know, basically the bottom line is the more, the more trading there is in something, the more not only the more liquid it is, but the better the price discovery process. You know, it's like it's like it's like going to a restaurant. Do I want to go to a restaurant where you know somebody stops in there, you know, once a week? Well, no, it's not. It's not going to be very fresh. I want to go to a restaurant where you know there, there's a lot of turnover because I know that what I'm getting is good. I don't really know why I brought that analogy on. It just seemed to make sense in my head for the minute. Maybe it's because <laughs> I'm hungry. But <laughs> I know you're a diehard connoisseur of gas station sushi, sir. Yeah, I'm losing my mind here. Okay, so that, that that's all I got on that subject. <laughs> I, I think you hit on the salient points, which, of course, bid ass spread at the end of the day. That's, that's what it all boils down to. Yeah, and all those other weird measures and metrics and things, it all is reflected in the spread. If the spread is tight, you know it's liquid. If it's not tight, then you know it's somewhere less than liquid. And if it's super wide, then, yeah, not particularly liquid. And that's kind of what really matters to you guys at the end of the day. Good question, Amelia, and good question, uh, Jeb. We'll have to get to some more on a future episode unfortunately it's all the time we have for the mail call on this episode it's also all the time we have for this episode of options boot camp man this episode just flew by these binaries you know yes no bam the episode's done uh, it's crazy but mr cook before we wrap up here uh we mentioned nadex where should people go of course they want to learn more about what you guys are up to and do you want to leave them with any hints or any teases of what's coming on the pike from you guys over there oh uh, well we have uh, we're actually revamping our entire education center um, they can find that very soon. We do have quite a bit already on the on the website now, but there's going to be a whole lot more at nadex.com, N-A-D-E-X.com. If they want to take a look at a demo account, which I strongly recommend everybody do before they put any real money in the market, uh, underneath the trading tab, you can apply for, for a demo account. It takes about 30 seconds. Uh, definitely take a look. Uh, I'd love to hear their feedback, even you know if they decide to trade them, if they're for them or not. And uh, we've got a, new app, uh, a few new apps coming out as well for the Droid and uh, the iPhone. So very excited about that. It's been a long time coming. I'm glad you touched on the paper trading because that's something I wanted to bring up we didn't get a chance to touch on. But, yeah, that's something people, a lot of people ask, and particularly with a new product like this or a new-to-them type product, you want to give them a chance to get their feet wet without actually risking any capital. So I'm glad to see that you guys offer that over there at Nadex. And, by the way, listeners, if you want to trade these things, you got to go over to Nadex.com, N-A-D-E-X. You're not going to find them elsewhere. Uh, that's the place. They are also the exchange. They're kind of all wrapped into one. So you go over there, you set up an account there, and then you can you can trade away, but you're not going to find them in other places. And if you do, they're probably Joe's house of binaries, and maybe you want to you want to stay clear. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Speaking of things we should stay clear of, unfortunately, we can't do that, Mr. P. He's still on the program here. So, Mr. P, what is cooking? What's coming down the pike in the land of market taking? Oh, boy. You know, we just wrapped up our uh, one-on-one coaching uh, acceptance. We uh, accept students for one-on-one coaching twice a year. Uh, I think we're going to be doing that again next year in April. So that is not coming down the pipeline. That has come down the pipeline. Uh, Let's see. What do we got? Oh, I don't know. We're going to start planning uh, our location, kind of unveiling our location for our annual options retreat, which will be held in the summer of 2016. We've got people emailing us asking us so where is it going to be where is it going to be so we uh we have to sit down and figure that out but it's going to be someplace fabulous because that's how we roll i'm still waiting for my my my, my invitation from last year i think i'm a little bit late on that one yeah it probably just got lost yeah i think it did it got lost <laughs> along with my full class ticket and the invitation to all the events and stuff by the way listeners if you're looking to check out some cool uh some cool dining options over there check out dan's uh, other venture he's got going over there the corks and knives cool stuff i like checking it out every now and then maybe you have a, a, a recipe you want to share so it's not all he's not all about options listeners he's indeed a renaissance man and on behalf of one dan and the other dan and indeed myself i want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading and streaming and subscribing to the show and of course for and such great questions. Keep them coming. We love to hear from you guys. And we'll see you next time right here on Options Bootcamp. Options Bootcamp is produced by the Options Insider, Inc. All rights reserved. The 
preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.